the guy who I would say was my favorite player once I became an adult. And Kramnik is not the most popular world champion out there for his playing style. You very rarely see him just win, like, just go for someone's king. There's a certain air of brilliance that you can see in some natural talents with guys who can create some absolutely stunning games just seemingly out of nowhere. But the reason that I like Kramnik the most, and I think also his style is, of all the guys like that, his style is probably the one who's closest to mine, uh, is he strikes me, I believe he's the best ever student of the game. I think in terms of what a human being can learn, he's done better than just about anybody else. And uh, I've seen that in his games, when a position gets completely ridiculous and irrational, he tends to falter. Uh, you know, there's guys like Anander, Carlson, or Nakamura, who when things get ridiculous and irrational, they don't seem to play particularly worse than they would in a more normal looking position. Mm -hmm. uh, and usually the sign of somebody who falters a bit in those completely irrational yeah. positions and really excels in other ones is a sign of somebody who has largely developed the skills that they have based upon learning the game from studying it, as opposed to practical skills from playing or things like that. And in that regard, I believe that Kramnik is the best player to ever play the game, who uh, who learned to, who just basically got better by learning, so to speak, uh, and by studying the game, as opposed to various other ways, such as practice or practical chances. In that regard, he actually reminds me a lot of myself. He's just a better version of me. You know, he's a guy who peaks, whatever, 80-some points ahead of me, maybe 90, and uh, as, also as a world champion. So uh, I've got a couple games of his I'd like to show, and this first one I want to show is a game with Luke McShane. So um, let's uh, also um, slightly better version of you, Greg. No, Nakamura is the better version of you. Um, okay, so let's get started. Um, here, I guess, if I'm sharing my whole screen, I don't know, maybe you guys can see everything on my screen, which is not great, but uh, this is fine. Okay, um, so this game started off with Luke McShane back, well, McShane was over 2,700 at the time. Um, so this game started d4, d5, c4, c6, knight f3, knight f6, knight c3, a6. This is known as the Chebanenko Slav, uh, g3 followed. Does anybody know um, what the main move is here after g3 and why? Greg is an I am not a GM, but unfortunately uh, they invited. Uh, real quick question, real quick thing for everyone. If you there's some new players here today, so if you want to be called on when you send your answer to Sam, add an exclamation point at the end of it. If nobody has an exclamation point, he might call on you anyway. All right. You have so a lot of people are suggesting Bishop F5, but my understanding was this was not supposed to be great because I think White has this plan of going Bishop G2 and then at some moment. He's going to go knight d2 and d4 very quickly. I remember thinking this was not fantastic. Um, but, uh, so the main move here is dc4. And uh, Black's whole point with playing a6 was to try to play dc4 and hang on to the pawn. And here, if he is allowed to play b5, he should hang on to it pretty easily. So I, white goes a4, he should hang on to it. p6. I hear him hearing echo. Is that, I don't know. Okay, uh, not anymore. Bishop g2. And so here, if white is allowed to complete his development and take back the c4 pawn, he should obviously be better. And black goes ahead and plays c5. This was pretty topical theory at the time. g3 was a pretty common line against the a6 slav. Uh, black is ready with knight c6 next to increase the pressure. Uh, does anybody know what the main move is here? Um, or what it, how it used to go? I played this position myself once with black, actually. Hmm, not sure. I feel like it's DC5. Greg is putting something on his head. It's a scalp massage. I suppose. Right. Helps right, me hey, Nietzsche with things. the sub. Thanks so much. Alright. So, guys, uh, does Anobi know this sort of semi old state of theory? Yeah, so Aradja has this right. Uh, the best move is D takes on C5, uh, or, well, at least was supposed to be the best move. And there is a variation now that goes queen d1, bishop d1. And I think that white's hope is that following bishop c5 and some kind of knight e3 or something, he will get the pawn back on c4 and uh, hopefully exert some pressure with this bishop on g2. 
Uh, but, I mean, for what it's worth, later on I found the move bishop d7 here, which in my opinion should equalize, uh, because black is ready to get the bishop to c6. So, for example, if he can if he can neutralize this long diagonal and then take on c5, I don't see why he'd be worse. I had a game with Abhijit Gupta here, where Gupta went for knight e5 and after knight c6. I think black gets enough counterplay, because if white wants to leave himself with the good bishop, black's knight is going to land on c5, and that's not something white's going to enjoy. Anyhow. That's neither here nor there, because Kramnik came with, I don't want to say a new idea, but a move that had not been seen much with Castle. Uh, and this makes a lot of sense, because White is hoping that if Black were to play Knight c6, White can potentially take this pawn and then take back with the Rook on d1 instead of with uh, the Knight. But after cd is played, Knight takes d4 and Knight bd7, now the fun really begins. White obviously has a lot of pressure, thanks to his Catalan Bishop on g2. Uh, but it's not so easy to see how to increase it, how to complete your development, or get back the pawn on c4. At this point, actually, I'm going to give you guys one more move with knight c2, which Kramnik played. It's not I think it's not even best. The computer said knight f3 is better. But this is the moment we're going to start here, queen c7. And basically from here, Kramnik's understanding of chess, largely it seems like guided by principles he would have learned from studying these kinds of lines, just shone through, and he played an absolutely stunning game. So... Before we start, uh, I want to get as many people as possible to turn on your cameras because, you know, Chessable is the sponsor of this class, and I love Chessable. use it all the time. And we're going to make a little tweet, and it's good if we have some faces in there. Yeah. So if you could just turn it on for, like, you know, just for, me, for long enough for me to take the photo, and then you can, then you can go back to hiding. There's two Bryans. What is happening? <laughs> all right, so I'm going to... Real quick. All right. Yeah. Go Trustable. Go to them for supporting this class and go buy my course that comes out on Monday. Oh. Um, but yeah. So Monday. here, we need to move for White, a way to com complete his developments. And what Kramnik came up with here was really, really impressive. And it all really came down to his understanding of what's important in these structures and how to create weaknesses. Um, so. What are we going to do with white here? Well, bishop f4 definitely comes to mind here. So just so everyone's clear, Sam is teaching the Zoom class. He's not really following the Twitch chat. Uh, I'm following Twitch and Zoom. I'm not real. I'm oh, muted in, in Zoom. <laughs> You'll not believe the stuff these kids are sending me. <laughs> so I'm thinking bishop f4 here, and then if black plays e5, so, then we'll go bishop A lot of people are saying bishop f4 e to e3. So uh, bishop f4 is um, is the best move. This develops with a tempo. It stops black from playing bishop d6. But obviously this bishop is going to get kicked by e5. Uh, the problem is e5 makes a clear weakness in black's position. Uh, he has weakened the d5 square. Now... Which square does white bring his bishop to and why? And this is not an easy question. I was thinking f6, but now I'm not, not so sure. It's not just which square, but also why. We need to know the reason. Okay, so. Let's evaluate some of these moves. Um, a couple of people have given me bishop e3, potentially with the plan of uh, eyeballing the weakened b6 square, but this doesn't excite me. I think black wanted to develop this bishop potentially to c5 anyway. Black looks ready to castle next. And white has obvious compensation for the missing pawn, but it doesn't really scintillate me. Uh, a couple of people have given bishop g5. And for me, when I was following this game live at the time, this was 2012. And as I said, Kramnik, he wasn't my favorite player growing up, but he became my favorite player when I was already like a grandmaster and, you know, let's say mid 2500s and trying to go further. He was the one I felt I could learn from the most from and the one whose style I emulated. Why is bishop g5 not the best move? White's whole goal is to abuse the d5 square, and it feels like bishop g5 should be a very consistent way of doing that. Why does this move not work? Hmm. 
people are getting this. Black is going to play h6, and the problem is now this bishop is unstable. And what black really wants to do is fight for this d5 square back, and the best way for him to do that is to get his bishop to e6. Mm. In order to do that, he must move his knight out of the way. So, by provoking bishop takes f6, knight takes f6, following knight e3 and bishop e6, I don't see a reason for black to be worse here. He looks more or less fine to me. Um, but, uh, as people have pointed out, it's better to play bishop d2. So now, uh, what is white's next move going to be? I, I guess knight e3? Everyone's got this. We're going knight e3 next. We want to go knight e3, we don't want to play e4, that blocks our bishop, but knight e3 and we're going to abuse the d5 square. Plain and simple, nothing could be more natural. Um, and it's very hard for black to actually defend the d5 square. If black has, let's say, we're not threatening knight d5 yet, but we're going to in two moves. Black has two moves to defend the d5 square. What moves are he going to make to do that? I guess knight b6 and, and bishop e6. Saying a5, knight b6, I'm not sure. a5 feels really dubious because it weakens b5. The problem with knight b6 is that it's unstable. We can kick it away, and then we right. can still go to d5 all the same. So if you want to play knight b6, you will have to play a5 first. And weakening the b5 square like this strikes me as asking for a disaster. Um, so, but what people are, but Austin has this right. The best plan is knight c5, as McShane played. This potentially is preparing for bishop e6. And then uh, to guard this square, then rook d8 further. It also potentially eyeballs knight b3, which could become important. Okay, now what does white do? I don't know. <laughs> hmm, knight b3 is pretty annoying. I don't like e4 here, guys. You don't want to block your uh, your bishop in like that. We're aiming to... F but this, this just showed an incredible understanding from Kramnik. Yes, Alexander, well spotted. You want to share it with us? Or Austin, whoever wants to. Okay, fine. Austin, we can ask you to unmute because you're there. <coughs> All right, so um, you said bishop g5 didn't work because the knight could recapture on f6, but now the knight moved away. So now we can play bishop g5 and threaten the capture on f6. Now and only now the bishop comes to g5 with the premise that our whole goal was to fight for the d5 square, and we are removing one of the defenders when it cannot be replaced. So uh, this whole, in those last three moves, going bishop f4, e5, bishop d2, and then bishop g5 over the course of three consecutive moves. This does not seem totally obvious, but once you have studied these positions to a degree and realized that this d5 square is what we need to abuse, uh, this is this becomes more natural, and this is a fantastic choice from Kramnik. So, oh, nice. there proceeded bishop e6. Kramnik, huh? White took on f6 and went uh, knight d5. Black tried queen d8. So white played uh, knight c3, which is easy enough. Uh, and here it's very obvious that white is aiming to put as much pressure on the white squares as possible. And, uh, and it seems like he has a healthy position as a result. However, the game is far from over. There follows knight b3. And with this move, black has a not so subtle intention. He wants to play bishop c5, castle, complete his development. If his bishop on c5 can challenge the knight on e3, he can potentially fight back for control of the d5 square. All right, this is one of the toughest moves of the game and the one that really set the game over the, across, on the course that it ended up taking. Take some time. Let's find White's move. What should he play and why? So, of course, the rook is hanging. Uh, yeah, this is uh, Kramnik McShane. Okay, Rio, is that double X clam saying you want to discuss this variation or just that you think it's an amazing move knight c4 makes sense but knight takes a1 queen takes bishop takes d5 rook d1 certainly possible not quite what I was looking for, Rio, but I like the energy. You have the right attitude towards this position, but White has a better way. Alright, so a couple of people are giving me knight takes c4. Now, sacrificing an exchange here does not strike me as totally wild, but I'm wondering about this one. So let's say we take on a1. And, uh... 
I guess if black takes, if we take back, I'm wondering how this is looking. Bishop d5, and if rook d1, we can play bishop c4. And I was trying to figure out what was going on after bishop b7, but I don't find this impressive for white. For example, perhaps black can ignore everything and play a move like bishop d4. When you will only be able to take one of these pieces and black is getting ready to castle, and I'm not particularly convinced by all of this. Uh, you don't necessarily need to take this knight right away, but, well, essentially here, you guys are looking in the right direction. White should be trying to, uh, blast black apart. Some people are looking at moves like f4, but the problem is white doesn't need to open the f-file. White wants to abuse the d-file. The problem is it's not easy to do, uh, because black's pieces are on, uh... Are in good squares and the queen is hard to get out of the way. So no, just queen c2. Some people are suggesting queen c2. Uh, this is interesting, but not what I had in mind. So what if black takes on a1, gets bishop c5, and is ready to castle next? This doesn't look so easy to to me. And black may be able to use the bishop as a glorified meat shield on d4 in some cases. Um, it says queen takes c4 first instead of knight a1. Okay. Hmm, not sure here. I think this is asking a bit too much. Uh, but we're on the right track. So, Austin, you say rook a2, and we want knight takes c4 next after bishop c5. That's not the dumbest thing I've ever heard. Um, but I also find it unconvincing. If black, for example, maybe can consider knight d4, uh, now you cannot take on c4 and black is ready for bishop h6 and castle. And I would probably still take white here, but I think it's not as clean as it could be. Uh, so royal, I think royal's got the move right. So royal, you want to uh, share with us what you found here? Yeah. Um, A5. Yeah. This is a very powerful move. Uh, so what's the point behind it? Um, maybe knight b6. That's not quite what I had in mind, but uh, the biggest thing white is doing is bringing his pieces into the game. He clears the a4 square for his rook. He wants to go rook a4, take this pawn, and then all of a sudden all of his pieces are playing. Once that happens, he will have undermined the knight on b3. And following knight takes a1, are we going to meet? Will we take that knight back, or do we have a better move? Yeah, everyone's seeing this now. Queen a4 check. And this is a much better way to sacrifice the exchange because we are forcing Black's bishop back to d7, which really ruins his prospects. For instance, I think we could have seen like an almost identical position here a second ago, uh, but because we have forced the bishop back to d7 and White's knight on d5 is left unchecked, uh, he has much better chances to attack. For example, here Queen h4 comes and Black... If black plays bishop e7, we can even consider something like knight takes e7, knight d5, knight f6, in a way that we would not be able to had black's bishop stood on the e6 square. Uh, white can also, for example, take on a1. And here black won't be able to castle. If his bishop were on e6, I think castle would be fine. But here castle, we're going to take a knight d5. And, um, and it all seems like it's falling apart. So uh, this move... A5 was very powerful. You guys all had the right idea on how to sacrifice the exchange. It's just Kramnik was the one who figured out the best way of doing it. So following um, rook c8, the best move was probably bishop c5, but it would not have solved black's problems. Uh, there follows rook a4, and then uh, black tried knight d4. His goal here is to um, preserve the pawn on c4 by counterattacking the knight on d5. Here Kramnik found a fantastic way to transform the... Um, to transform the position. So, what do we do now? The first move should be easy, but the second one is harder. Okay, well, everybody's giving me f4. f4 just doesn't ever do anything, guys. You go f4, fe5, and then what? I mean, the f file is pretty well under control. We're really aiming to fight on the white squares. That's your hint.
Yes, Aradia, you want to share with us? Yes, that's a no. Oh, Razi, yes. Okay, Aradia, where are you? Let's us to unmute. Okay, so I said um, Knight B6, because mm -hmm. it's just attacking the Rook. He's probably going to go, like, Rook C7. Yep. And then I was thinking just Rook take C4, because, like, our Knights are too strong, and the Rook on H8 is, um, like, less uh -huh. powerful than our Knights. It comes down to comparison. We could play knight e takes c4 here, and I don't know, black will play bishop c5 or something. And just imagine this position. Which piece is better? The bishop... Wait, should I say it? Anybody. I mean, it's, uh, it's, okay. it's not even a question. It's abundantly obvious which is the better piece right now. The bishop is just the better piece. All of the fight is going on in the white squares. Black uh, needs to get himself castled and get his rook into the game, and he will not be able to do that if the white squares are this vulnerable. So, rook takes c4 is a fantastic decision from Kramnik. Following bishop c4, knight c4, um, black played knight b5. There's really nothing here already. Uh, it's, um, I mean, I think Kramnik gave this as the best line for black, but rest assured, this is not going to hold together. Following something like knight e6, we give a check and rook d1 comes and black should lose. So, um, the game continued uh, with knight b5, now queen b1 from Kramnik. And one thing I wanted to point out was, if I think if I show Kramnik's notes to this game, and this just shows the depth of his understanding of these positions, it's a pretty stupid thing, but um, what Kramnik wrote was, he said, uh, computers prefer queen b4, but I like my queen on f5, right? Well, if you look at a more modern engine compared to what they had at the time in 2012, the modern engine says queen b1 is the better move. He had his con the courage to go with his convictions. I mean, of course, it's pretty dumb because everything is winning. But it says here that uh, a second ago, if you go back here, it does say queen b1 is the best move. And it's and it really shows that Kramnik had the courage and his convictions to go against the machine and develop his own understanding of the position. Now, perhaps this is... Um, perhaps this is... Uh, are sort of immaterial because white's winning either way, but all good. All right, so for the stream, I think we probably have to get it back to board only. That's fine. Um, but so here, uh, the game continued like so. One thing that I don't think Kramnik was good at was just sort of intuitively ending the game when it came time to strike. But he supplemented that problem with very precise calculation. And I view calculation as opposed to tactical vision or instincts in a sharp position as more of a trainable skill. Calculation is not something anybody is particularly good at naturally, and it takes work at. And Kramnik here, for example, in this position, absolutely every legal move wins. You turn on the computer and he will, uh, and it will just say, E takes F5, like plus eight or something, sure. But, um, but here what I like about Kramnik's style was that he was very, um, is that he basically didn't leave anything to uncertainty when it came to when it came to messes. He didn't really thrive in positions that were like wildly messy. What he thrived in was he just turned them into simple positions. He would calculate them out as opposed to relying on intuition in complicated games. That's why in a position like this one that can be calculated, uh, he just found a way through. And so it's probably a stupid question for me to ask you guys to find the best move since everything wins. So I'm just gonna go forward with what Kramnik did. Checks and captures all the way through. This is the sign of somebody who calculates very well. Check first, rook d4, knight f5, and then here it looks like black's getting away, but what does white play? Chop on f7, well spotted people. Hmm. So uh, after king takes f7, there is queen g7, and if nothing else, white can take the rook, which should be good enough. I was about so to So black say that. played king d8. Uh, queen g7 and rook f8. This was all very forced up to here, and I'm sure it was easy to calculate. And what Kremnik had to do was think back to the position after queen h3, see up to here, and find one of two winning moves. And there are two. I will accept either one. What it should I play? It takes d4 looks really, really powerful. People are getting this. There's two ways through. Knight takes d4 or knight d5. They're both um, perfectly effective. So Kremnik chose knight takes d4, which was good enough. Uh, rook c6 was black's sort of only try to defense e6, but now uh, with material being pseudo-equalized, the game is basically finished. 
But this is sort of what I'm talking about. This position here is irrational and silly. White is absolutely winning, there's no doubt about it, but in positions like these, this is sort of where Kramnik began to struggle a bit. For example, here he played, uh, this was move 38 or 39 or something. He played queen d2, and after king c7, queen d7, check king b8, he got more time and then won the game very routinely. Uh, there's nothing wrong with queen d2, although I think this is the move that you should make. Um, but after queen d2, one thing Kramnik wrote in his notes was that bishop g5 would have complicated the game considerably. And he gave this line knight d7 check, king c8, knight takes... Uh, and here he gave queen d1, which he called the simplest. To me, this is not the simplest. This is the simplest. Clean, straightforward, easy. We immediately transition into an absolutely winning endgame for white. The threat of bishop takes a6 check will actually win black's rook, so he doesn't have time to take on a5 or e1. And as a result here, black is absolutely dead. There's just no discussion to be had. This endgame is a clean, easy technical win. We take the pawn on a6 with the bishop. Something like take this pawn, duck this bishop back here where it's nice and safe, bolster with b3, knight d3, no weaknesses ever, everything's perfectly solid, and then just boom, 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 boom. It's not even close. Like, the game is just finished. Right? So, this is the kind of thing that I that I think was missing in Kramnik's play. And if you look at his match with Anand, the games that he ended up losing were from irrational positions. When the games, when the positions looked normal, uh, Kramnik prevailed. In any case, uh, this is one of the games I wanted to show. Unless there are any questions about this, I'd be happy to go over the next one. Yeah, guys, the notes are in Megabase. You should read these notes. They're good. You can learn from people. Come over them with a critical eye. I mean, it's, it shows a lot, especially these notes that people wrote back a long time ago. All right, so let's move on. I'm going to close this. Uh, this was his game with Nakamura, but um, let's go back to this um, this game with Geary first. So one thing about these guys who um, or I guess sort of like Kramnik and to some extent like me as well uh, is, uh, but you know, obviously he's the better player and the better version of it, is these guys who have learned a lot over the years and who are very good at learning a lot about chess and applying that knowledge and winning games with it is they can, like I said, they can sometimes struggle in irrational positions. But people like this tend to be very motivated and very well prepared. And one thing I really liked about Kramnik was that uh, he basically clobbered the King's Indian. And if you're talking about guys playing d4 or knight f3 or something with white, the King's Indian is what reaches irrational positions. And Kramnik understood them very well, and he basically made sure to study them to the point where he was just crushing them all the time. So this is a game he played with Anish in 2011. Uh, after castle, bishop e2, e5, we just went straight into some main line um, with, uh, after knight h5, g3, here knight g5 came, and uh, Kramnik played bishop f3, which at the time was a new move. Now is the main line. Uh, thanks in no small part to his figuring out what's up. So there followed um, c6, and Kramnik played bishop a3, which was a novelty. Does anybody know how the game normally continues after b5? Mm. Alice says c5. I don't like that. c5 I don't think makes sense, because now white can play knight e6, and this bishop suddenly becomes very good very fast. Um, but, uh, okay. Anyhow, the, the state of theory, if I recall, was there was some long forcing line here. It's like take, take, and... Or something like this was supposed to be okay for black, I think, somewhere. There's also, if I'm not mistaken, h6. I think this is a line as well. And then knight e6, we take everything. And at the end of all this, after bishop a3 takes... I think white's supposed to be slightly better here, but black realistically is going to make a draw, if I'm not mistaken, uh, was how it sort of went. But uh, here Kramnik played bishop a3. And uh, I think that his point was these lines are not going to work as nicely for black now in some cases. But um, in this game, uh, c takes d5 was played. And Kramnik could have taken back cd, but he chose to play e takes d5 instead, which keeps the game a bit more complicated. There followed the very natural move e4. Uh, and bishop e2 was given an exclamation point by the annotator. Now, this is a very important point to realize here. Knight e8 is a bad move. 
given an exclamation point by the annotator. But that just means that that's what the computers were recommending as best by the time. It doesn't mean this annotator is an idiot. It means that the machine thought 98 was best. Uh, this was a game from 2011. It's a, it's a different era. After 98, uh, white goes rook c1. And so here, Geary uh, played for h6, 96, and we got to this point. After knight c7, well, Geary played knight c7, but we're going to start with queen c8. Here, uh, according to, well, there was a line that the annotators gave, but I believe that Kramnik had a different idea in mind. How are we going to play this position with white? There's a very specific sequence that I think uh, Kramnik probably had in mind. Yeah, it feels like we gotta open things up, either knight d5 or c5. Everyone's giving knight d5, yeah. Knight d5 is the move. Uh, and interestingly, the machine at the time said c5 was best, which is possible, but after knight d5, queen e6, what gives? This is a very important idea here. c5, whoa. Can I take d5 and go knight f6? Seems like a bit much. Hmm. Maybe knight f4? And then c5, bishop We're saying c4? c5 here. I don't think this works. Why can't I take this and go knight f6? I think I get away here. Queen b3. Yeah, this is not going to work so well. I mean, you can play bishop b2, and then I don't think you're going to just, like, lose, but king h7, bishop f6, queen f6, black is very much fine. c5 wasn't what I had in mind, at least not here. White has a very important idea. And my guess is this is what Kramnik was thinking. It wasn't him who annotated this game, so we don't know. But there is an important idea here. Hmm. Guys, you're all just guessing moves. We need an actual sequence. If you don't find more than one move in a row, there's not much point to it. So Alice has something that makes a little bit more sense than all the nonsense everybody else has said, uh, which is knight e7 and c5. White has these bishops and is trying to open the game. This makes some sense, but I have to believe black is fine after taking this pawn. It just takes him a move or two to go knight f6, rook fd8, and should be okay. Um, so Daniel's getting closer. Uh, the best move is knight f4. This kicks black's queen, and she doesn't this. have a great place to go. Yes, yes, Yvonne, well spotted. So... I said no. uh, following queen f7 here, we're ready to go c5. And now black is facing a massive problem with bishop c4 coming. But uh, after d5, what do we do? There's one more critical idea here. Not too hard, but we would have to see a little trick. Because this looks scary. Black's getting a big center. Hmm. Knight takes d5, I don't think that works. Black can take back and go knight f6, and then I have too many pieces on the d5 one. Maybe just b5? Yeah. b5, c6? People are saying c6. That strikes me as a bit impatient, but you're on the right track. So a lot of people are saying c6, but I like b5 more. The big point, though, is here. It's very easy to get this far and get spooked by this move, kicking the knight away to somewhere incredibly ugly and potentially getting ready to consolidate the position. If white's knight is kicked away before he can uh, undermine the d5 pawn, but yeah, everyone's getting this here. Bishop h5 is the move. This is my, my guess is this is what Kramnik calculated and that this is what he wanted. Bishop h5 is a very important move, and without this, it just doesn't work. Like, black would be fine but maybe more than fine even if he can secure the d5 pawn. Bishop h5 ends the game immediately. So this was a fantastic line, I thought, um, seeing that white is in time to go knight d5 there. In any case, Geary instead played knight c7, which was even more problematic. And here, uh, Kramnik found a very nice variation. Geary unfortunately didn't walk into it, but rest assured, he still felt the pain very quickly. Uh, Black has the not-so-subtle intention of taking the pawn on e6, which could cause some serious problems. That knight will be fantastic, and it's not clear where white's compensation would be. White has to find a very precise sequence here to maintain a good position. Uh, and Kramnik did... well, I mean, Gary didn't let him, but Kramnik found the first move. I'm sure he saw the whole way through. 
What are we gonna do? Hmm. I need a real variation, guys, not just a move. Keep in mind, any variation, any move you give me, you should have an idea of what's going to happen after knight takes e6. So I've seen b5. Okay, so Ariana, do you want to be called on? I can do that. So b5 is the so I take this one. And what did you want now? Now knight b5. Okay, so if I go knight c5 or d4 or something, why am I not like winning? Knight c5 also looks very good. <clears throat> no, this wasn't quite what I had in mind. Okay, so Austin is saying b5, knight e6, we go queen d6, and then go for this position with c5, but, eh. and no, this bishop is trapped. I find this unconvincing. Do I have to take that queen as well? Maybe I do, which would be sad, but I guess I do, right? Yeah, I gotta take this queen. Yeah. Um, there is a better move here. Uh, much better, even. Okay, Arthur's got this. Arthur, you want to share with us? Okay, you don't want to share with us? Okay, Maybe fine. Queen well, we're running short on time, so I'm going to go over it. Uh, so Arthur spotted the line um, queen b3 with the point that if black takes this, we go c5, and now d5, we take this pawn, pointing out that the tactics are in white's favor. After this, we can go rook fd1, knight d4, take, take, rook d1, and that's a pretty nice way to end the game. Uh, white is down a rook, but there's not a thing black can do about losing two pieces, which is quite a nice way to finish things off. Uh, so Kramnik was very good at finding these ideas to break through. Uh, and what he's done here is he's, it all goes back down to that same thing. It's calculation. He's seeing all these key lines. So uh, it's not so much that his intuition is guiding him to like play the move rook c1, or queen b3. I mean, is, this position also isn't even that irrational, but I'm sure that Kramnik had studied these kinds of things before. And so uh, after h6 is played here, I mean, Geary instead, um, Geary tried bishop e5 here, but uh, this whole thing just fell apart after king g7, and it, it just collapsed. Here, this does not take a rocket scientist, but what does white play to finish the game off? Take it. Take it. Take on d6. Rook d4, and cd6, and knight d5, and rook c7. You can imagine how much longer this game lasted. A couple more moves. Uh, so um, yeah, they're just to see the finish. Uh, rook e7 would have been a very nice way to finish the game, but Kramnik finding bishop b2, queen d6, and rook b7 is also quite nice. Black is basically stalemated, um, and uh, is about to face a devastating attack. The game continued g5, I guess, like, rook c7 also creates a very devious threat to play knight f4 now that the rook is uh, no longer hanging. So black tried g5 to stop that, but white kind of sadistically b6. I mean, why not? Like, if he takes it, rook b6 wins, so you might as well give yourself a pass pawn. After a5, bishop h5, black's rooks really didn't inspire much confidence here. And what was the last move to finish the game, guys? Bishop of seven. Oh. Although here, I think even here, Kramnik found another pretty sadistic move. And that's a mean one. <laughs> here, and then check. And black resigned on pain of king g6, knight e7. So, one thing that's very important to know about this game. This felt like a very brilliant game, and certainly Kramnik got some well-deserved accolades at the time. But let's return to this moment where it turned out knight e8 was a mistake. Uh, at this point here. Does anybody want to try to find the best move? Because there is a way for black to get a decent position here. B5. 
five. Wow, feisty. I don't think that's quite right. Maybe also, F four. I don't think that'll work. We're White's very happy to just get that exchange. F four. A five and then H six G five. I think White's very happy to see A five. That will just wake up the A three bishop if you ever take on B four. It's tough here. Um, so Radia says H6. This is the best move, but only with one very specific idea in mind. After knight E6, what does black play here? Very important move. Hmm. D5, whoa. That's no sense of danger. Come on, guys. D5, B5, no way. We're going to get... White's going to get connected past pawns like this. We can't play like that. Um... <laughs> Okay, Aradia says G5. That's on. That's closer. Why do we want to play G5? Ah, we're just getting this. We throw F4. Oh, F4. Like and the this. point is here. There's actually a fair amount of counterblow because uh, if White takes, we have this lovely move Knight H5, pointing out that in the event of Bishop H5, there is Bishop C3. Uh, and I think that this is all of a sudden not particularly safe. I mean, you can try Rook C1, but Black, I don't know, retreats the Bishop somewhere, takes on F4 next. I think all of a sudden Black will have very real counterplay. Uh, but the real point was the computer at the time, the fact that the annotator said 98 was the best move. I mean, I don't have that old version of whatever the heck, you know, Ribco was running back then or Houdini. But basically what that means is that the computer was saying that 98 was Black's best move. And Kramnik still won the game very cleanly. If we now get rid of this game and move on to the next one I wanted to show real quick, but not the whole game. Uh, this was a game that Kramnik played against Gristrup less than a year later. They reached the same position, and here Kramnik could have played bishop a3, repeating that same game, into a line that the engines at the time were saying were good for white. The fact that Kramnik had figured out, he had taken this brilliant game where he crushed Geary, like, really badly, uh, he, uh, he figured out that this was not totally sound, in an era when the computers weren't particularly pointing it out very well. And here, he found an improvement with bishop g2. This shows a complete player who, even when he was winning a fantastic game in fine style, had uh, the introspection to look at it more closely, make sure that there was nothing wrong, and when he found out that there was something wrong, he made an improvement. Furthermore, he figured out there was something wrong with it in, in an era where the computer was not able to tell that to him. He had to have studied it himself. And, Good point. and someone says, sounds like Beth. No, it doesn't sound like Beth to me. Beth was brilliant. Breath just saw everything. Everything was intuition. Kramnik, this this bishop g2 here, this is the move of a student of the game, a fantastic student of the game at that. And uh, as a result here, I think this just really showed his incredible depth of knowledge of the game, his incredible dedication to studying it, and and what he uh, and what he could learn from. So uh, the game with Grishuk here continued. H6, knight e6, take. And then Grishuk went for this same kind of variation. And here we see Kramnik's point with the move bishop g2. He does not have to take back on e4 the same way he would need to if black had played, um, if he had played bishop a3 first. So, what's he going to play here? There's a fantastic move for white. Maybe b5? Sometimes they throw in b5 in these positions. Because it's it's important to just get b5 bishop a3 very quickly, and black doesn't want to play c5. Be careful. If black gets d5 safely, your position's not going to be very but much. But b5 fine. d5, white gets to go bc bc ah. bishop a3. Greg comes up with a genius suggestion. Good job, Greg. I was distracted, but okay. Cupcakes. Someone smart once told me make make improvements, not excuses. But yeah, Nathaniel's got this right. The point of bishop g2, and this did, this clearly was something he came up with before the game, this was the result of doing a good job of his homework, was um, to play b5 here. I know In the event that. of c takes b5, we have bishop a3. And black's position collapses immediately. But uh, if d5, bishop a3 comes all the same. And here what we see is black is not able to, um, to take the e6 pawn the same way he would. If white had started with bishop a3 like he did in the previous case, and we had seen something like h6, and seen the same variation here, take, take everything, and d5, 
the problem for white is that he doesn't have time to play b5. He spent his time taking on e4, and that means he has to burn yet another tempo with his bishop. I mean, he can play b5 here all the same, I guess, or you're supposed to do it like this and then b5. But as discussed, this is probably okay for black. So realistically here, what's going to happen is white is going to move his bishop. When that happens, black gets queen d6, which means he will take the e6 pawn. And so what Kremnik had figured out was by starting with bishop g2 here, He's going to be able to instead uh, play b5 and then quickly play bishop a3 and prevent black from using the b6 square for his queen. It's also, I believe, very important to start specifically with b5 because if you play bishop a3, then black can play b5 himself, locking the bishop out of the game and letting him play g5. So, b5 is, I believe, a very powerful move. Uh, Grishchuk played rook f6, hoping to take this pawn, uh, which made some sense. And now and only now, white takes on e4. And it's just gorgeous. The point is that in the event of d5, now bishop a3 works like a charm because this endgame is significantly less holdable for black than the previous one. No prizes for guessing why. So, uh, <laughs> here already black cannot play d5. After rook e6, though, um, white still has, white's still down a pawn here now, and, well, what does he do next? He has, uh, he has an important idea, and Kramnik uh, found the way very nicely. I'd probably take once on c6. This one wasn't then... really the most brilliant move out there. It was just sort of a simple one. Bishop so A3? Alex is saying bc6, but after bc, bc, we have to question, does this change affect the position in a way that white is happy about or a way that he's unhappy about? I actually think the answer is he's very unhappy about taking on, about the exchange of b pawns for one very important reason. Our whole goal here will be to stop black from playing d5. If we can stop that from happening, the bishop on g7 is not going to have a particularly good role. Um, so, we would really like to stop d5. I'm just saying bishop c2 to b3, not quite what I had in mind. Bishop a3, I don't believe that stops d5. Or maybe it does, but, eh. Bishop a3, maybe queen a5, I'm not sure. Still no one's got the move I had in mind. I'll give you a hint. Think about why b takes c6 would harm white's position. Someone's saying queen g4, rook d1. That's a very close, but is the queen designed to... Are we trying to win this game on the king side or on the queen side? Everyone's got this. Queen b3. This is why it's important not to include bc and bc. We need the queen to be stable on the b3 square to discourage black from playing d5 further. Uh, uh, here I believe Breschuk uh, played d5 anyway. Um, did he? Queen B3. No, he started with, or sorry, Kramnik started with Queen A4, but quickly the Queen ended up going back to B3. I think Queen B3 was actually stronger. But uh, Queen A4, and here uh, after CD, Kramnik found the same idea to play Queen B3. But this sort of shows what I think. I mean, I think Queen B3 was better than Queen A4 in the first place. Kramnik wasn't perfect. Nobody ever is. He made mistakes, but quickly he would find the right coordination. And here what's going on now is this pawn is hit. And if black has to play d4 and leave himself with this bishop, I think he's basically crushed here. White goes bishop a3, brings the rook to c1, and there's just not a thing black can do in this position. Oh, am I blundering my rook? Yeah, sorry, I'm blundering my rook, my bad. There was, um, yeah, so here rook b6 is played. And Kramnik, he didn't rush. He found a very nice move here. Uh, he played a4. He was in no particular rush to get things done. Like, I think somebody gave this line bishop d5 and... White's probably better here, but why are we waking up that bishop on g7? Uh, yeah, so this was blind here. After a4, black could have played d4, but or, or something like queen d7, bishop a3, d4. But a position like this one is approximately hopeless for black, and it all came down to white's ability to keep this bishop on g7 out of the game. Black's whole problem in the king's inning is that his bishop on g7 gets blocked in by his own pawn on e5, and then white wins the game on the queen side. In order to make this kind of thing work, he needs to get kingside counterplay, and here that's just clearly not happening. Uh, these pawns are not particularly things Black's really happy about having. Sounds like so, a typical Friday. Um, after uh, a6, <laughs> as Gristrick played, uh, Kramnik found a fantastic way to finish the game off. He played bishop a3, and after ab5, he took this one and went for rook takes d5. 
And this just highlights the difference of the quality of these bishops, plain and simple. Uh, following b4, white goes a5, queen f7, and now... Uh, well, the game lasted two more moves. Realistically, anything wins for white, but let's try to find... What Kramnik did to finish the game was just very clinical and very Kramnik-like in terms of its style. Um, Ashish has the first move right. H4 is very good. Provoking H5, looking for another, looking for weaknesses on the other side of the board. And after H5 from Black, what's the final move of this game? Yeah, Archer's got this. Queen D1. Queen D1. Double and attack. now this just does it all. Rook D7 is coming. This rook is now defended, so AB6 is a threat. Queen H5 is in the air. This way that Kramnik had in these sort of complex lines that normally you would think wouldn't suit a player like him, who is more somebody who's well-trained and somebody who has learned a lot and not somebody who's going to necessarily thrive in, like, wild positions. The way that he could make guys like Grishchuk and, Gear and Geary look completely uncompetitive was really uncanny. You know... When you see Magnus just win games and make the best players in the world look like idiots, usually you just can tell it's because he was a superior player. Yeah, you know, he outplayed them. With Kramnik, it's almost like he just figured out before the game exactly what was going on. Not only in terms of his, the quality of his opening preparation, but in terms of his understanding of the plans that had to be implemented later. And as a result of that and the way I've seen from him, I do believe he's the best ever student of the game. Uh, and he's the one who I've modeled my own play after the most. I think he's probably the world champion you can learn the most from studying, even if he wasn't the best ever. I think, you know, if you were to rank the best world champions ever, I think, you know, Carlson, Kasparov, and Fisher are clearly above Kramnik. There's no doubt about it in terms of how dominant they were or how great they were. But in terms of what you can learn from studying their games, I think that uh, Kramnik would be my favorite one. Arthur says, will I be the one to do the lesson on Magnus? I hope so, because I'm going to spend the whole time insulting him, and then I'm going to send him the video afterwards. Um, anyhow, uh, there's the one point I want to think, I want to show, is like, let's, the one last thing in Kramnik I had before we call it a day, is the position here that you guys can see, this was a game between Hikaru and Kramnik um, at uh, the Olympia 2012. I think Black is losing here, no matter how he plays, but this move, Rookie 7 from Kramnik, just sort of highlights... I think the sort of deficiency that you see from him with irrational sort of positions, this is a straight blunder that, you know, should be, you shouldn't make it as, as a player of that level. Um, what's White's win here? Oh, I've seen this one. This is cute. This is nice. Full variations, guys. Nobody's actually seen the solution yet. So we can take on e7 and push. For all these why not c7 people, at some point e2 is going to come. And then when you take it, there's always f3. And then black is going to go e2, exactly. So you got to be very precise. So take, take, c7, e2. So be careful. Yeah, everyone's yeah. getting this down. All right. So we take this, and the point is that following c7, e2, we don't take this pawn as then f3 check will save the game. But, oh, well, it's not going to let me make it, but we're supposed to be making a knight. Uh, so, well, that's Oops. what Hikaru did. See you at night. These sort of irrational style things like that, like, you take a guy like Naka who's just brilliant beyond belief, you know, I'm, <laughs> I wake up every day wondering why can't, why wasn't I born as brilliant as Hikaru? He can just do this kind of thing. He can find this stuff in a one minute game like it's nothing. Just like, no matter how irrational or silly a position looks, you dump him in the most ridiculous looking thing. He's going to find the best move almost as well as he would in a line in something that looks very similar to something he studied. He's just amazing like that. He's a phenomenal natural talent. And, you know, there's a video of this on YouTube. The second Kramnik plays Rookie 7, I mean, Hikaru thought about it for a minute, but, like, the second he played Kenny's Rookie 7, like, Kramnik, uh, Hikaru immediately just reached across the board and grabbed a knight before he, even before he made his move. It's like he had just seen it in, like, half a second. Um, you know, wow. these are things that guys like Hikaru and Anand and Carlson just can do. And usually guys like those are the ones who prevail at the top. Guys like Kramnik who learn, most of them get very, very good. Kind of like me, very, very good, but there's a reason I've never made world champion or whatever. I think that reason, or, I mean, who you knows, maybe I could one day, and I hope I can still get better than I am now. But the reason uh, that I think Kramnik did was he just did this learning thing, this analysis, learned to play the opening, the middle game from you know all this analysis. I think he just did it better than anybody else. In any case, that's why I think what you can learn from him. Uh, so, um, 
Uh, yeah, so I guess for the last little bit, I'd just like to open it up for any general Q&A. Uh, any questions or anything, any of this stuff? Wow, that was really cool. How much needed is chest base? It's very needed. It's important. You need to have it. Or it's hard to... I don't know how to do good analysis without it. Is two bishops first knight winning? Yes, it is. Brian, come on, stay on topic. Let's not discuss politics. Who is my favorite chess player before Kramnik? Kasparov. Uh, honestly, Kasparov, in terms of my favorite, I think Kasparov still is my favorite, or maybe Magnus, but it's more who I think I can learn the most from is Kramnik. That's maybe a better way of saying it. Um, five knights versus one bishop. Come on, guys, no troll. Yeah. Have I ever had to do two knights first pawn? I almost had to do two knights first pawn once, but I didn't actually have to. I can show this. This was um, with our pal, Mr. Savion. Uh, where is my games here? Can't find it. There we go. Um, this Savion game, this would have been, what year is this? This, is 20, this would have been 2016, I think. Um, Yeah, so this game here, for those wondering about that, it's um, two knights versus pawn is technically winning. Funnily enough, Sevian actually did get that same end game against Karyakin at one point. Um, but yeah, so deep into this game, like I outplayed him, but it was very tough and messy. And um, at some point, uh, yeah, so here when I played knight b8, which was, I believe, the only winning move, and I was happy to find after knight f5, Knight c6. If he had taken this one, I cannot play king f4 because of knight h5, so I'd have to play king f3, and then knight f5 comes, and I can't save this pawn. I would have to go something like knight e5, and I don't believe I will be able to promote this b-pawn without letting him sacrifice the knight. Uh, the the h-pawn is going to come and distract one of my pieces to the point that I won't be able to dominate the knight, and my guess is this will come down to... Um, to two knights against the pawn. But no, uh, Sevian, he um, he took back on c6, and then he's just busted here. Like, I win the game on the king's side easily, and while well, his king is off dealing with the pawn. And, yeah, so that, uh, it, it could have happened in this game, but it didn't. And then, funnily enough, the only time I've ever actually seen it happen after that in a game like between strong players was when Sevian also was involved, and he, he went for it against Karyakin, and Karyakin did win. All right, I'll take one more question before we call it a day. What material do you use to study calculation? Uh, my coach, Jakob Algard, he's the best. Uh, he does a thing called homework club, for example, at like uh, at killer chess training, which I'm, which I do all the time. Like I constantly have these uh, these sheets printed out that I'm just working on all the time that Jakob uh, gives out. Wow. Most of the ones that I do are private, just me and him. But I also do homework club. I mean, he's the best. Uh, he's the best trainer there's ever been. For the and, uh, yeah. Um, that's good calculation work. All right, I will uh, leave it at that. And uh, unless there's anything else from Greg or Kostya, I think we can call it a day. No, oh, thanks so much, Sam. It was awesome. Now you're a bad liar. Okay. What was I lying about? That it was awesome. Oh, no, of course it was awesome. It's great. Okay. All right, good stuff, guys. Um, uh, see you all. Next next class is on Tuesday. It's Jesse Cry, and he will be looking at games from Smyslov. So, I knew it was going to be somebody old. I knew it was going to be somebody mm -hmm. old. Said Jesse. All right, have a good one, guys. See y'all later. Thanks for thanks for being here.